uh, what we're going to be doing next, uh, that's all the announcements that we have. So now we want everybody to get to know everybody else. And so we're going to do some quick five minute introductions, just go down the list here so that everyone knows who else is in the call and where everybody's from. So for these introductions, Gloria and I will kick it off and we'll just read down the list. But we're going to ask everyone to share out their name, studio, and then because the topic of this group call is all about interviewing, we want to, what is one thing uh, you want to know about uh, other studios? What is something you want to ask or something that you're really interested? Um, so uh, my name is Ross Brunetti. I am a fellow here at DFA National in Evanston, Illinois. I'm originally from the Case Western Reserve Cleveland Institute of Art studio from Cleveland, Ohio. And something that I, uh, when I was in my studio, was really interested in knowing about was what uh, other uh, projects uh, other um, DFA studios were uh, working on throughout the year. And Gloria, when you want to, Gloria's taking notes while I talk, and I'm taking notes while Gloria's talking. Yeah. So, yeah, no problem. Um, hi, everybody. You already know me. My name is Glory. Um, I was from the RISD Brown DFA studio. Something that I'm interested in knowing is. What you guys do for studio studio culture it seems like i'm the only RISD brown person here so for us we would have like picnics and hikes and we go to a lot of conferences um let's see i'm just gonna pick the next person off of my screen so marissa do you want to go next yeah sure um so hi i'm marissa um i'm studio lead at usc in southern california um and one thing that i want to know about other studios is like how big are the teams and like how like what's your maximum size you have for teams on for different projects in your in the different studios so, yeah awesome nicole you want to go next you might be muted or i don't hear you maybe everyone else does nicole can you hear us i can hear you guys Oh, you might have to hold the mic up to your mouth. I think I heard you for a little bit. Okay. Is it any better now? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Much cool. better. Sorry. Um, I'm Nicole. I'm from UC. Um, I'm a studio lead there. One thing I'm wondering is also probably the social thing. Were you able to catch that? I, I think you cut out a little bit at the end there, Nicole. Could you repeat your, your question? <laughs> yeah. Um, what is it that everyone does? Um, like what Glory asked. Mm. So what activities? What does everyone do for studio culture? Yeah. Nice. Cool. Awesome. Great question. Um, Irene? Yeah, um, I'm from the Duke Studio, um, and I'd like to know what others, what people think keeps their studio members motivated to keep working in DFA. Like, what specifically um, do they find appealing or um, valuable about working at D, uh, working in the studio? Awesome! Thanks for sharing, um, Dan Ching. Am I? Do you have another name that you go by? DQ. DQ. Oh. I go by DQ. Yeah, I go by DQ. But like, I just typed cool. my full name there. Yeah. Cool. Nice. Uh, so I'm from Northwestern, and um, I also really want to know like how do the studios keep uh the members engaged, uh, and just like maybe not really like a but more like a fun, um, project, like a fun club that people want to come meaningful part. You know, that's my that's the thing that I want to know. Yeah. Awesome. Cool. Joey? Hi, I'm Joey from Michigan. And one thing that I would like to know from other studios is how do you encourage shy or unconfident team leads? Mm. Cool. Great question. Um, Elizabeth? Hi, my name is Elizabeth. I'm from UNC Chapel Hill. And I guess one question I have is kind of other um, studios kind of timelines and how they kind of plan 
projects throughout the semester? Good question. Good too. And Shivani? Hi, my name is Shivani. I'm from the UC Davis studio. And I guess my question would be how you guys choose topics that members are interested in working on throughout the quarter. And last but not least, Anna. Cool. Um, hey guys, I'm Anna. Um, I'm from UW in uh, Seattle, Washington. Um, and my question is, how do you make sure that all of your material and everything that you teach in DFA is accessible to people who are either underclassmen or not experienced in design? Amazing. Great questions. Thank you everyone for sharing. Wait, I think there was some there was one more. Steph, did you did you go yet? Not yet. Oh. Go not ahead. even on my screen. My bad. So sorry. No worries. Um my name is Steph. I am a co lead at Fordham University in Manhattan. Um and I guess my one question would be uh, how do you continue the momentum of getting your team sort of outside of the studio space once you can kind of get past the process of ideating? Cool. Uh, was there anyone else who hasn't had a chance to speak? I just want to make sure we got everybody. Sweet. Okay. Cool. Great questions. This not only uh, you'll have the opportunity to ask some of these to each other, uh, but they'll also be really helpful for us at DFA National to know what you guys are interested in. So without further ado, Gloria and I have prepared a presentation that just kind of summarizes the interview process and the key points. And then we have a breakout session for you all to take part in where we're going to put you into different breakout rooms and you'll be able to follow along uh, in the notes doc and fill out uh, as you go and do an interview. So uh, I'm now going to share my screen. You guys see? You guys see my screen, or do you see this presentation? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Perfect. Go back up here. Nice. So, uh, welcome. The title of this presentation is called An Interview is Just a Conversation by Ross. Are you Benetti able to full screen the presentation, Ross? It's a little tiny. It's a little tiny. Let me see here. Is that better? <laughs> sure. Sure. I just have, I just have the PDF open. I don't have the the actual PowerPoint. I apologize. Uh, is everybody okay with this? Good. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Wait. So an interview is just a conversation. Uh, and welcome. We're Gloria and Ross. And we're here to, here to tell you that an interview is just a conversation. Uh, that is one of the main takeaways that we want you to get out of this. So Gloria and I, uh, at Summit this summer, we did a presentation about interviewing successfully, and this kind of has bits and pieces of that presentation. So we've been able to learn about this topic a little bit more um, uh, over the summer, and now we're gonna share it out again with you all here. So an interview, uh, t when does an interview take place? Currently, a lot of studios are in the immerse phase of the design process is what we found out with the update form. So uh, immerse in the DFA uh, process is really the opportunity for DFAers to engage with stakeholders and really understand the problem from the people that are most affected. So when you're immersing, you're gathering up a lot of information. You're really just trying to be a sponge and understand what's going on. So you'll be able to then reframe after this and move forward into the create phase of the design process. So the purpose of an interview during the immerse phase is to gather firsthand experiences and information that is crucial to informing the human-centered design process. Human-centered design uh, requires you to interface with a lot of humans. And so the way that a lot of humans ha have, uh, are able to interact with each other is through uh, communication and conversation. A conversation or an interview in this case is a really great way for you to learn about somebody's experience and really uh, allow them to be the expert of their lives and give you those, in, those insights into what they're experiencing so that you can 
uh, move forward uh, informed with the design uh, as you go through the design process. So interviews at this stage uh, have many different forms. Um, there are many different formats. You can have um, interactive um, interviews where multiple people are participating and telling you, acting out and doing something and then telling you what they're doing. That's a form of interview in the conversation. So there's just many types of interviews, but the one that we're focusing on today is just the conversational, the kind of traditional interview that you may think of when you set up a date uh, with a person to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with them to learn more about a given topic. So just be mindful that there are other types of interviews out there and all of them have the main parts, but the one that we're gonna focus on and be doing today is just where you are able to talk to somebody one-on-one -on -one and really gain insights in their experiences. And like I said before, no matter what type of interview that you go into, there's always these particular parts of this protocol for an interview. There's a before the interview occurs, there's a during the interview, and then there's an after. So that's just the basic structure of an interview, no matter what format it takes place. Before the interview, uh, you wanna be prepared. This is the part of the interview where you are generating questions and you're identifying your assumptions and being aware of those assumptions so that you think about the questions, you think about what you think you know about those questions and then you refine so that when it comes time to uh, interview the person and have that conversation, you are ready to go and you're really re ready to have a conversation with that person. So at this point too, it's really important to know your problem context. You have to identify and immerse usually go hand in hand so as long as you're familiar with your problem and you've been able to really understand it, you're able to identify your gaps and assumptions, you're gonna be going into your interview really prepared. The third check mark says, know who you want to know, or excuse me, know who you want to interview. So if you don't know something through your identifying as you're immersed, it's really helpful to find somebody who does know the thing that you're trying to learn. And the thing that you're trying to learn is really important too. You have to know what you want to know and you have to know who holds that information so you can find them and have a really fruitful interview with them. And so the more work that you do before an interview, the more work, uh, the more fruitful you're, it's going to become afterwards. And during the actual interview, so you did all the work, you set up the interview, you now have the person in the room with you. Uh, you have the interview itself. So this is the part of the, the, the interview where you're asking the questions and it's a conversation. So we're really gonna focus on the conversational aspect and what it means to have a conversation. And you wanna be really open to wherever the conversation may lead, uh, but you also wanna make sure you're getting all of those questions that you prepared and identified assumptions before the interview answered. So it's be very mindful of what you're trying to get out of the interview when you go into it and make sure you actually, when you have the person in the room with you or on a telephone with you, you're really able to uh, get what you needed to get out of the interview from that person too. So you come in and you wanna have a conversation, but you also have to have a measure of success that at least having all of your questions addressed or um, being open to the conversation, leading you to a new insight that you might not have uh, recognized in the beginning of uh, the conversation. So be curious, we're asking questions. Um, and at this point too, it's really important for the interview to document. Uh, we encourage that usually more than one person be uh, attending the interview from a team so that one person can have the conversation and one person can document. Uh, so that, that those documentations are really gonna be helpful for after the interview. So after the interview, you have documented during, uh, you say thank you to the person, uh, at least in person and probably with a follow-up, I encourage you to say thank you two times or more, uh, whatever deems appropriate. And you wanna to offer to build that relationship. Um, so there are many opportunities and there's actually a, a group call on Wednesday where we're focusing on community partner uh, engagement and relations with Lucas, who is a UIUC alum, uh, who also was a former DFA national intern uh, on Wednesday. So if anyone would like to learn more about how to continue to build relationships with community partners, there will be a group call on that. And uh, if you're unable to attend, we'll be recording and sharing out these group calls uh, at the end of the week or early next week. And it's okay, so after you have the interview, you thank them, you're building the relationship, either inviting them or keeping them in the loop of, loop of the, pros, the as your team um, progresses through the process. 
So feel free to ask follow-up questions if needed. So that's why establishing that rapport and that thank you allows you to realize, oh, if I didn't realize I forgot to ask something, I learned something, this would be a great person to ask. Feel free to follow up and ask questions. And the next thing that you're gonna do that a lot of teams do is you take that, um, probably not everyone on your team was at that interview. So you have to synthesize your data, share it out, or oh, the lights go out here. I turned them back on. Um, the lights, uh, so you're sharing out the, um, the, the data, the insights that you gathered from the interview with your team. So you have to be able to document so you have those um, key points and those key takeaways fresh in your mind when you're sharing out with your team. So if you're looking for another detailed protocol of uh, the design process, again, Gory and I, for Summit, we put together a step-by-step -step, uh, worksheet that is available in the resources in the notes doc. So check that out. Also, our full presentation is available for you to view as well. And with that, I am going to kick it off to Glory to give the rest of this presentation. Glory, are you good to go? Yeah, there was just a little bit of a cutout, but thank you, Ross, for that great intro. Um, I will be talking about a few of the meat of the conversation when you're actually there with your partner and face-to-face uh, -face talking. And so during the actual interview, you would be ideally starting with a professional introduction. That means introducing yourself, your name, um, your DFA team, probably one or two sentences about what DFA is, and also specifically what were your goals in coming to and setting up this interview. Um, along with that introduction, you want to ask permission to document, um, and also tell how that information will be used. So in a DFA context, it would be for research, and usually, you know, you might say it'll be presented in front of your DFA studio and maybe your school, um, but that's the ex extent to which that information would be shared. Um, and going off of documentation, again, as Ross said, having a team to assist is really helpful because then you have one person specifically to pay attention to your interviewee, ask questions, listen carefully, and another person there to take notes and take photographs. Next slide. All right, so um, I'll start with some broader tips and tricks. And so usually you'd, you'd want to follow up with what your interviewee is excited to tell you and easy ways to just get them to say more about what they want to say is just ask them tell me more oh was something happening oh, something happening i think it's okay just i echo. just hear a little um echoing if someone has their thing not on mute um, but it's gone now. Okay, so that's great. So you can just ask them to elaborate on their story and they'd be happy to tell you more about um, what it is they're talking about. Um, the other thing to keep in mind during an interview is that one of your goals should be to understand the feelings and motivations of your user or stakeholder to sort of flesh out um, their role and their place in this context. Um, so instead of asking about a specific emotion like stress or frustration or or happiness, you might as well just ask how they felt about it. Um, and that way you'll get a very raw and honest answer. Next slide. Um, along the same topic, uh, your conversation might derail. Someone might want to talk about something that you didn't really come here to learn and that's okay. Um, sometimes you'll you'll discover something new, but sometimes it'll be completely relevant. And the thing to keep in mind here is that their time is very valuable and so is yours. And so the best thing to do is sort of, if it's not going where you want it to go and you're not getting the content that you need, you might as well, you know, bring it back to the focus topic and say, that's great, thank you so much for telling me about that, but I would really love to know more about this certain topic. And that way you can respectfully bring it back to what you came here for to interview. Um, and here's a slide because we are working in the social impact space. Um, many project teams may be working with sensitive topics with very personal issues. And so here are some sample questions that are framed in a way that is very mindful. And so this is, these are ways to ask um, in a very respectful way to also elicit more 
raw and honest responses from the people that you're talking to. Um, one of those ways is just to be affirmative and um, sit, tell back to the person what you interpreted from what they told you. And that way you can clear up any sort of assumptions and biases you might have brought in um, while also confirming with them that you heard what they said and interpreted it in the way that they wanted it to be interpreted. Um, similarly, along with the note about emotions and feelings, um, you can ask a more broad question, like what angered or excited you about what happened? What's familiar about what happened? Um, and then also framing them in terms of past and present. So how did something affect you previously and how does it affect you now? Um, all right, and then the next slide, just to wrap it up. Here are some more like general tips and tricks um, for the, the meat of the conversation. So if it's silent and you don't really know what to say, one thing that you can start off with is just your personal experiences to get the conversation going because you should have done some research on this already. Secondary research, you must have read some articles, you probably have some personal interest in the topic of the project that you're working on. And so it's totally okay to start by you talking and them responding to what you already know about this subject. And if it is quiet in this phone call or in the room, it's okay. Um, more often than not, than not, they're probably just taking a few extra minutes to think about how to respond to your question in a very thoughtful way. And so they're not awkward. They're just sort of waiting moments for them to come up with a, a meaningful answer to give to you. Um, and last but not least, um, be curious and not an expert. You're here to learn about what the other person has experienced and understand their interpretation of this problem space in this context. And so just sit back, um, put your biases and assumptions aside, and just be there to learn and ask a lot of questions. So uh, to wrap it up, like interviews are, are conversations, but they do take time to, for, for you to feel comfortable having a conversation in a quote unquote like interview setting. And so it does take practice, which is why we're here today. You guys are going to get a lot of practice interviewing your peers. Uh, Ross, you want to introduce the workshop? Yes. So now it's your turn. Uh, is everyone could please go into the note stock. Uh, I'm going to walk you through the breakout session that we're about to go into, and we're going to go through. So what's going to happen? Uh, there are three different boxes in the breakout session here. And what we're going to do, we're going to have everybody uh, break into breakout rooms. So we're going to separate you into smaller groups, and each of those groups are going to host an interview for somebody else. And so don't pull this out yet until you're in your group because you'll be assigned to a particular topic, and that'll be the worksheet that you'll be filling out that's in the doc itself. So first thing you're going to do, you're going to identify roles. There's going to be at least three people in the group. So you're going to identify an interviewer, someone who's asking and engaging, a note taker to document, and then an interviewee. The interviewee, after you go through this first 10 minutes here, is going to switch to another team, and that will be the person that that team interviews about the topic that you're generating the questions for. And going back to this, so the individual brainstorm. So silently, when you first get in, you're going to identify everybody. You're going to generate questions. And then you're going to identify assumptions about those questions. And then together, you're going to come up with the official questions that you really want to ask in your interview for five minutes. So you have five minutes to quickly generate some questions about this topic uh, and then assumptions. Then you'll be switched. And then the, the interviewer will conduct the interview. Uh, and the, there will be notes taken here for 10 minutes. And then Gloria and Ross will move the interviewee back to their original team for synthesis. And then you will uh, share out what you learned um, with the interviewee as they return back to your group. So that gives you the practice of really understanding and synthesizing, quickly sharing out um, the synthesis so that you'll identify pain points and opportunity spaces from the individual that you uh, worked with. So there are three topics here. How do you teach the design process? Uh, how are your pro projects conducted and run? And then how do you recruit and retain members? So that's what we're getting ourselves into. I'm going to stop sharing my screen now, and I'm going to uh, break everybody into their 
breakout rooms. So it is just random selection. Introduce yourself to your interview team real quick. Identify your roles and start making those questions. Does anyone have All any right. questions? Uh, yes, uh, one quick announcement. We will be popping in and telling you um, how much time you have left for the next phase. So it'll probably be 740 when you're gonna switch out into your inter actual interview session. Nice. Cool. Okay, I'm okay. assigning to everybody randomly to a team, and it's very exciting. We have the perfect number of people for this, so thank you all for coming today. And now I'm going to start the breakout session. So um, just work in your assigned group, and we will see you back. And just follow the timeline, and we'll pop in and out. See ya. Hello, DQ. My name is Steph. <laughs> um, I'm from Fordham in Manhattan, and I'm just going to ask you some questions about the uh, design process at your studio today. Um, firstly, what is your name and role in your DFA studio? Uh, my name is DQ, and I'm currently the studio uh, lead, but I work on the leadership department. I work on uh, learning and development before. Yeah. Cool. And how many people are in your studio? Uh, currently, there's about 34, I think. Yeah, so we have five teams. And wow. Each team has five to six people. And then there are some, like, execs who's, like, floating around. Mm -hmm. That's actually really cool. I'm very jealous. We have a very small studio here at Fordham. <laughs> it's very hard to... Um, Oh, I can imagine, yeah. <laughs> Wait, breakout session ends in five seconds? Um, oh, my. Let's see what happens. Uh... <laughs> okay, we'll move on to question three. How many projects do you all work on during the semester at your studio, DQ? Five. Five. Are they different projects, or do you all work on, like, variations of the same project? Oh, oh. Uh, so we... So we have five teams working on different projects. So okay. that will be like five projects and one, each person will just work on one project. Right. Cool. And do any of the projects um, kind of connect or are they all very different topics? Um, there are similar ones, but then like each would have a different community partner and because of that, the nature of the project would be slightly different even if they're in the same space yeah okay gotcha um all right and how familiar is your studio with design thinking values uh i would say like half of the studio are quite familiar with the process already. So for the new members, especially the freshmen, um, they are less experienced. But uh, another thing is like, we have a lot of engineers uh, who apply to DFA in Northwestern, mm -hmm. and the engineers will go through a similar uh, design thinking class when they are um, in fall or like winter quarter. So they do have some background knowledge about what uh, design thinking is like. And for those who are not engineers, uh, they come in with just like some interest, but they do not necessarily have any knowledge about design thinking or like the process that we use. Okay. And can you walk me through how you teach the design process um, to these members? Uh, so it's kind of like learning by doing. So we would have, so we have open studios every Sunday and during open studio, we would have about half an hour, uh, half an hour would be dedicated to some like announcements, presentations and stuff like that, or like sharing. So some past uh, project members will like share how their project went and then what they did. So sometimes they would touch on certain techniques that they used. So that's, and um, the learning and development leads would also uh, provide some like uh, slides about how you should go about interviews, how you should go about observation, uh, synthesize, or like brainstorming, stuff like that. 
so at the beginning so what we're trying to do now is like at the beginning of every quarter so we run a quarter system uh we would have one open studio just for design sprint so that everyone would everyone can like roughly like catch the idea of like what this process is like and then mm -hmm. it will help them to um learn the full process in an easier way uh when they are actually doing their own project during the quarter but then like on a week this we have some presentations but most of the time for techniques people like the new members really learn from like returning members because we always make sure that besides the team lead there's always some experienced members who are able to share their knowledge about design thinking with the new members so it's more like the each team will help the new members learn on their own and then the exec would also provide assistance if they are like all lost so like oh, oh here's some like uh useful tips uh, you can take or like we will like go through the process and find like what are something that they are stuck at or like what are some roadblocks that they need to like overcome yeah okay great <laughs> Um, you mentioned that you had open studios on Sundays, um, so it's just kind of an open invite to anyone, or do they have to be part of the DFA uh, team? Sorry, like it gets cut out a little bit. Can you repeat the question? Um, you mentioned that you had open studios on Sunday, every Sunday, right? Yeah. Do they have to be part of the DFA team, or can it be anybody who's interested? And if they're just interested, how do you try to keep their retention rate up? So Open Studio is only uh, so uh, Open Studio is just for members, but members are free to bring their friends. But oh, okay. the friends would uh, but not a lot of people bring their friends here because the friend would just like sit there and watch them do right. like, some tasks that they need to do for the project. So uh, what we do is like some we're trying to. We're trying to get some outreach programs, but we haven't really started doing that. So that's the idea there. Uh, so it's just that for members. So that's really mm -hmm. part of your question. And then um, engagement is something that we are really trying to make some changes in the studio about engagement because we do have a very high retention rate. But the thing is like, a lot of members are saying that the studio feels more like a class now. It feels more like during class. We don't really like that. So we're trying to have more like gradual events. So we're trying to like encourage people to, hey, let's just hang out and like maybe we do this together. So there's a lot of like proposals going on and we're just trying mm -hmm. out some new things this quarter. So I can't really say like how it's also like a question that we're asking ourselves. So I can't really I don't have a lot to show to keep people engaged, but I think people at Northwestern mainly come to DFA because they know that they can make an impact through the project that they're, they're doing. And I think that's the main goal of most of the members in the studio. Yeah. I absolutely agree. I feel the same way about my mm -hmm. studio, about much of the points you made. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for answering the questions. Thank you so much. <laughs> it's really fun talking to you. <laughs>
Um, so yeah, tell me a little bit more about how you kind of got to that position. Sure. So I, uh, two semesters ago, I was a team member. And then the semester after that, I was co-VP of training and co, I guess it was called a student, like co-lead of training and co-lead of um, event planning. And then I was voted in as president this semester. We don't have, we don't have studio leads anymore. I don't know when we started calling things president, but I guess it'd be the equivalent of a studio lead. Gotcha. My, uh, my studio does that as well. Okay, good. Um, okay, so, um, so a little bit more about your studio. What is the size and makeup of your studio? Sure. So we are, I think, about 15 people. We're kind of like recovering from a weird semester. We have six team leads, but we they're they're on two teams. So it's two team leads per team, and then one what we call kind of like an advisor. So like a really senior member of DFA, like three semesters or more. Um, is on those teams. Uh, I don't know if you heard earlier in the call, but I had a question about unconfident team leads because mm -hmm. we had to like put people who had been in DFA for one semester as a team lead just to have enough you know, teams and stuff and to oh, train yeah. people. Out. So there, we just had to like double up. Like we can't, we can't just force them in there. So, but other than that, we have all new members is team members because all the returning members were moved into team leads. Oh, cool. Awesome. So now that you've got your team leads, um, do those team leads now have members too? Yes. So our teams are about six members on each team. So okay. They are all cool. Awesome. So um, can you describe a little bit about where you are in your, um, your process with your new teams? Yes, so we have just gotten done with our Immerse presentation day. Um, they have just gotten to that point, so we gave them feedback for Reframe to get ready for that next week. We meet uh, once a week, and we do a step every week, essentially. There are some steps, um, bills, things like that, that we're going to spend two weeks on, probably. But our teams right now are ready for Reframe. Cool. Awesome. So um, have your team started thinking at all about community partners and have they identified any? Yes. So we started one project with a community partner. We are working with a juvenile facility high school um, in Lansing, which is really close to us. And the other community partner that we have is a anti-counterfeiting agency that's partnered with our university. Ooh. It's kind of wild. Wow. It's kind of wild. Oh my. <laughs> I think it's like, oh, they had like a summit event. So some of our team members went and they're good. So first of all, they, they got goodie bags, which I was jealous. Their goodie bags had a v Bradley wallet in them. That was part of the goodie bag. Oh my goodness. So, <laughs> that's one of our partners. <laughs> Those connections, man. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Um, so can you describe a little bit about how you identified those community partners? Sure. So I was actually pointed in the direction of the juvenile facility um, by a woman I work with because they have a couple of big and diverse issues. Um, she was on the advisory board for this. This is a government program. Mm -hmm. So we set up an interview with the kind of like principal of the school, I guess you would call it, and then moved on from there. and. One of our senior members, um, who was the president two semesters ago, found the counterfeiting partner. But mm. that was after we had they had established that they wanted to work on the issue of fast fashion. So they found mm. that partner after they had decided the project. OK. Very cool. So how did you teach to your teams what a community partner should be and what that looks like? I think we're still in the process of it, especially with the counterfeiting team. Like we're trying mm -hmm. like fast fashion and counterfeiting like don't seem like an obvious pair. So I'm like, if you can make the case, make it. Um, I haven't we haven't had to do that so much because it's only it's two teams. 
And because it's so okay. small, I'm directly involved in a lot of the work for finding community partners. I think going forward, I would just, I mean, the most important thing is somebody who will work with you and somebody who will implement the changes that you want them to. Okay. Awesome. Um, so, uh, I guess switching to a new topic. Um, so how do you provide examples of the entire design process to your new teams now that they're kind of up and running, they've got their community partners, how do you teach what the rest of the process looks like? So every meeting we have the first 30 minutes to an hour dedicated to teaching the process um, of that specific step. And the work of the meeting is all based around that step. So we give like examples of what they should do. So on like immersed days, we had stuff like, you know, find like three to four articles and write down slap facts and um, find relevant authorities that you can reach out to. So kind of like prompted them to do certain stuff, but then once that time is over, they continue to work on their project in that same frame of mind, but without our direction. Okay. Are there any points when you kind of tell a little bit about each stage of the process all in one go? Um, Only during or how do you... Okay. Awesome. And then is that like in the beginning of your semesters? Mm -hmm. So the very okay. first, we actually have two design sprints. The first is just for leadership. And then the second mm -hmm. is a full studio um, design sprint. Sprint, okay. Cool. Um, so uh, going off of that, what does a year-long timeline look like for a team at your studio? So for a lot of the teams, this is a semester timeline. So most mm -hmm. of our projects are semester projects. You get a lot of returning members. So there is a point in the semester probably coming up pretty soon where they can look at their project and say, I want this to be a full year. Um, mm -hmm. But usually it's semester. Okay. Awesome. Um, how do you, so do you encourage some teams at a certain point to say, hey, like continue this into another semester? Um, we or usually, how do they decide that? Sure. Um, so we, I, I'd like to, them. I don't like to like prompt it even because there's always going to be team members on that team who are like, I don't want to do this again. Like I want more free time. So I usually let them kind of formulate their idea, like kind of, you know, before the build phase. But at the point where you'd realize this is a pretty big idea and we have a good community partner and this is this is going to get implemented. Um, so the longer that we work with this, the better. Okay. Awesome. Um, yeah, that was all the questions on our list. Woo. Okay. Okay. Uh, so Elizabeth, do you want to ask questions? Or uh, I think I think based on you're interviewing Nicole and I'm note taking, right? Yeah. Okay. Sure. Cool. Okay. So, hi Nicole. So I'm part of hi. this DFA. Blah blah blah. <laughs> introduction. What is DFA? Or what are we doing this for? Okay. Um. Now. Cool. Great. <laughs> so first off, is there anything you'd like to say on your own about um any uh thing that you find important about teaching the design? Oh recruiting teams and retaining members or would you like me to start it off with questions um yeah some quick context about our studio is that we roll on a semester basis and we have a like internship or co-op program so that means every other semester people are leaving the school and going on internship and then coming back which means that every other semester our dfa studio is essentially like changing so we have like one set of dfa and then we have like another set of dfa because of our weird rotation wow that's actually really cool are the internships uh, in any way tied to the DFA projects? Um, usually not, although I get my first internship kind of through DFA. Um, but yeah, like internships just like based on the majors we have, like all of our engineers, designers and stuff like that go on internship every other semester, so. Yeah, so then uh, something I'd like to know, uh, what do you look for members when you are recruiting? Um, yeah, so we look for people that are really passionate um, because DFA is something that ultimately people can choose to be really part of or they can kind of like not do anything and that kind of hurts the team in the end. So we really look for people that are dedicated 
um, so that way we don't put them in teams and then have their teams rely on them and then they fall through. And just wondering, because um, it's kind of different at my school right now. We're just trying to like get anyone who's interested into the team. Um, is yeah. this a selective process for you guys? Like, do you reject people who are somewhat interested but not passionate enough? Um, we're trying to move to being more selective, but in the end, like, we just don't have the numbers to be super selective. Um, like, we were trying to get 24 people, like, 24 spots this semester, and we got, like, 26 applicants. So, like, we only really rejected, like, one or two people. Um, so, at that point, we <laughs> we can't really be super selective, but ideally, we would love to be, like, to, to, like, interview people and stuff like that. I know USC has an interview process where they, like, do applications and then a round of interviews. So, that would be kind of cool. 26 applicants sounds really great. Wow, you can't, we can't, like my student can't even get like six people <laughs> interested. That's crazy. Yeah, it's, ours has been like as big as 40, but like that was like in the past. Let's see. Yeah. And so um, what disciplines do you have a lot of now? And what would you, which disciplines would you like to have more of in your team? Yeah, so half of our club right now is literally second year uh, graphic designers, which is really interesting. Um, that's really helpful, but then also not because when they go on internship next semester, half of DFA is like wiped. Um, so we have to recruit for that next semester. Um, and so we're really looking for anyone that's not a design major. Um, at our school, we have a really dis like strong design program. And so every time someone hears DFA, they think, oh, like design. And so like all the designers join, but then we don't have enough engineers. We don't have enough like people in arts and sciences. We don't have enough, you know, nursing people. Um, so ideally just anyone outside of design would be great. Wow. And uh, how are you reaching out to more engineers or arts and science students? Yeah, so my co-lead Ellen is, um, she was in architecture, but then she moved into like arts and sciences. And so we're trying to use her some of her connections um, just to really like expand outside of design because most of my connections are in design. Um, and so we're looking to yeah market towards more like maybe poli sci majors or journalism majors, stuff like that. Great, yeah. Reminds me of like my studio again, like where at least my school doesn't have a design program, doesn't have a design major at all. Oh. So people, I know people who are interested in design, but they're really struggling to like find some sort of unified resource. So it's very difficult for them. Um, so I think we're like right now we're getting mostly like engineers and computer science students. But it's really so great interesting. Know. Yeah, it's, it's really cool to learn about like different compositions. So yeah. Yeah, we'd love some computer scientists and engineers. Like that'd be great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so weird. Wait, collab, <laughs> collab in the future. Is yeah. Like, who knows? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Also, Elizabeth, do you, what do you get? Do you have anything that you're super heavy on, just like out of curiosity? Um, super heavy on, or just like, I guess I can contribute. It's kind of interesting because uh, Chapel Hill compares to Duke. We get similar members. We attract a lot of biomedical science engineers because that's pretty much the only engineering yeah. program we have. And then we also get a lot of comp oh. sci. Um, it's because we don't have a design school at Chapel Hill. So people who like to kind of do that kind of stuff are the engineers, you know, are the comp sci majors who love oh. projects to work on. But we also get a lot of business majors as well, which might be a difference. Because of entrepreneurship, we kind of really market that for ours. That's a really good idea. I'm going to yeah. write that down. Yeah, no worries. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so they actually have an entrepreneurship minor at UNC Chapel Hill. And also our advisor is from the um, Office of Innovation and Entrepreneurship. So that's kind of how we get our plug there. In the past, we also had media and journalism people as well. But our connections kind of fell through a little bit when uh, there's a transition in power, but yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Do you, what years do you guys have? Like we have a ton of second years and first years, and then we have a hard time of training like third and fourth years. What about you guys? I, Irene, do you want to go first? Yeah. So right now well, I just joined this year actually. So what I heard from last year is that they have like 20 people and then the, it just got reduced to like two people in the end of the year. And so now we're basically starting from scratch. And so we only have sophomores and freshmen. I'm a sophomore myself and the rest of the studio leads are also sophomores. So everybody from upper class, are, they're all gone. Wow. Yeah, well, I, would say, I would say that um, we've been in the same situation as Duke. So we, Chapel Hill's actually always been smaller than Duke. We normally don't exceed 10 members at all. Um, wow. 
I know it's really it's not it's because I don't know I feel like I'm not quite sure exactly actually this year we have like 10 people plus me so 11 and that's we're, that's actually like we normally have like five to six so and they, <laughs> they tend to be um first years or upper classmen so it's really hard to get those middle people but this year we've done better so we oh. have more freshmen and some sophomores but then we also have like me who's like a senior you know cool Are there any main reflections uh, from this experience that anyone would like to share out? Any cool insights that anyone learned? I'd like one from each of the teams, at least, please. Joey, do you want to start? I don't know. Um, Mike, how about, yeah, go ahead. OK, awesome. Do you want me to start? Good. Okay. So one thing that was cool was I was the interviewee and I got started thinking about things that I didn't otherwise. So one question about how do you teach what a community partner is? Because we have a smaller number of teams this year, I was able to work really closely in finding these community partners. But when we have more teams, I'm not going to be there to hand pick out community partners. So how do we teach them what a good direction to go in is? That was something that I had to start thinking about when I haven't had to deal with that this semester. Cool. What about the Teach the Design Process team? Hear me? Is that team one? <laughs> oh, yeah, that is team one. Okay. Oops. Um, yeah, sorry, I had to call in because my laptop died. <laughs> but I was in this group. So. One thing that I learned is like, although we have very different team size or like studio size, we are all very concerned about studio engagement. Uh, it's like how to keep this, like how to have like a happy studio besides like teaching people how to do design and how to like solve problems. How, what else can we do to really make a community, make like make it like a really good like design community for people just to learn from each other. Yeah. All right. And then final team, Elizabeth. Um, yeah, so I guess what's kind of interesting is um, one thing is that we all kind of have a similar thing that we like to address is kind of like how to recruit people from different majors. It's just kind of interesting to hear about how some majors at other schools are attracted more to like DFA versus like other schools, for example. Um, yeah. Cool. Uh, does anyone have any other pressing amazing things or any other questions? We're coming up on the end here. So uh, before we do that, actually, if everyone, just as a reminder, DFA loves feedback. Um, so at the very bottom of the note stock, there is an I like, I wish, I wonder. And we really appreciate it if you scroll all the way to the bottom um, and give us some feedback of what you liked about this talk, what you wish it would have been different or something you would wonder as we move into the future. Um, that would be great. And while you're doing that, uh, just before you log off, please do that. And uh, Corey, do you have anything else you want to add? And then we can see what happens next. Yeah, there is also a Q&A section where I plopped in some of the questions you guys have from the update form. We'll try our best to answer those in a sort of like follow-up resource roundup email. Um, or something of the sort, but if you have other questions about interviewing tactics, feel free to ask them now or just write them down. Anyone have any other questions? If you would like to continue the conversations that you are having, um, I can put you back in your breakout rooms, um, but <laughs> I want to be respectful of your guys' time. So uh, if I'll, I'll stick around for a few 10 minutes after at least so that uh, you can talk to somebody uh, about either interviewing or just other DFA national things or just uh, other studios. Uh, but feel free if you are interested in having a conversation, I'd be more than happy to put you in a breakout room so you can talk with a studio lead. I know that doesn't get to happen that often. Play. Um, thank you for being a part of this uh, technical, technically difficult <laughs> DFA uh, group call.
Thank you for filling out all the update forms last week. We really appreciate it. It's how we at DFA National know what's going on at your studios. So keep a uh, lookout for update form three in a few weeks um, so we can prep for group call three. If you have any ideas for uh, anything or if you know someone who'd be an amazing guest on a group call, uh, let us know. Uh, Ross at Design for America, Gloria at Design for America, we're here for you guys. So um, if you have any other questions, I'll stick around. I can put you in group uh, into, into rooms or anything. So thank you again for your time and have a great rest of your night. Gloria, do you have anything? Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you.